This is Optimal Health Daily, episode 504, Reconsidering Moderation, by Becca Shearn of minimalwellness.com. And I'm Dr. Neil Malik, reading you some of the most popular health and fitness blogs out there, with permission from the websites, of course. Now, we recently got permission from Becca to narrate her content, so a big thanks to her. She's a registered dietitian and a fellow wellness nerd, and happens to be the partner of Joshua from The Minimalists, who's often read on our other shows. So definitely check out Becca's site at minimalwellness.com. All right, so it's June 21st. You know what that means. Four days until Christmas in June. Yes, I know I have a problem. And in fact, one of my friends recently pointed that out to me. We had some friends over playing games and we were serving them some coffee after dinner. One of my friends took notice of all the coffee mugs on the table, paused and said, um, so who's obsessed with Christmas in this house? Because when you look at all of my coffee mugs, they're all Christmas themed. So I proudly raised my hand and said, that would be me. So yes, I'm aware I have a problem. Maybe I need to reconsider my Christmas mugs so that they're in moderation. Ah, you like how I brought it back to today's theme? So let's get right to the post as we optimize your life. Reconsidering Moderation by Becca Shearn of minimalwellness.com. The most frequently dispensed advice from nutritionists and doctors regarding diet is everything in moderation. But what happens when it's clear this approach isn't working for so many in our society? It's time to reconsider moderation. Upon significant reflection, the everything in moderation mantra that I, as well as the vast majority of healthcare providers espouse, might be terrible advice. Moderation is a squishy term. It's nebulous. Moderation leaves us vulnerable to marketing and societal pressures to engage in consumption patterns that may be harmful to our health. Think about the top two items we discuss moderating, sugar and alcohol. What do they have in common? They're both heavily marketed and potentially addicting. Coincidence? No. The profit margins on alcohol and high sugar foods are outstanding, and because they both have the potential to be addicting, we tend to be easily lured into excessive consumption masked as moderation. We are bombarded with advertising of, to borrow a phrase from Michael Pollan, food-like substances, particularly those that are deleterious to our health, such as sugary beverages, cereal, fast food, and alcohol. Children are often susceptible to food marketing, and as a result of exposure to ads containing these foods, their intake increases. Considering that half of the advertisements directed at kids are for food, their susceptibility becomes rather alarming. Who hasn't witnessed a child react to seeing an ad for a fun-sounding rainbow-colored breakfast cereal by exclaiming, I want Surfer Smurf cereal for breakfast? Look at the back of that cereal or any packaged food item marketed to kids and you'll likely find an alarming amount of added sugar. Research done by the American Heart Association determined that children in the U.S. consume four to five times the recommended daily limit for added sugar. So yes, it's possible we're activating the addiction pathway in toddlers. Of course, toddlers grow up quickly, and those of us who were fed high-sugar diets may be pre-programmed to overconsume sugar as adults and to be more susceptible to other addictive substances. The average American adult now consumes an average of 82 grams of added sugar per day, which is three to four times the recommended intake limit of 25 grams for women and 38 grams for men. Clearly, that moderation message isn't working well and it doesn't just stop at sugar. What sugar marketing is to children, alcohol marketing is to teens and adults. In the US, there has been an over 400% increase in alcohol marketing over the past 40 years. That marketing has consequences. Exposure to alcohol marketing results in earlier age of first consumption and in higher consumption patterns in those who already drink. While the percentages of people who drink versus abstain in the general population have remained relatively stable over the past few decades, about two-thirds of the U.S. population consumes alcohol and about one-third abstains, the rates of consumption for those who do imbibe have increased. According to physician and addiction specialist Dr. Ruth Pote and an article she references from the Washington Post, half of those who consume alcohol, which is one-third of the general population, do so in relatively small amounts on average less than one drink per week. The other half of people who consume alcohol, about one-third of the general population, do so in far greater amounts. One drink per day puts you in the top 30% of alcohol consumption. 
two drinks per day puts you in the top 20%, and the percentage of people in this category is rising. Then there is a gigantic leap to the final 10%, those in this group that consume an average of 10 drinks per day. Let that sink in. 10% of the US population consumes, on average, the equivalent to 10 drinks per night. If one in 10 of us is drinking, on average, 10 drinks per night, then what's moderate? Moderation is no more than one drink per day for women or two drinks per day for men. And what constitutes one drink might surprise you. 12 ounces of 5% alcohol by volume beer, think not a pint of a standard microbrew, five ounces of wine at 12% alcohol, or one and a half ounces of 80 proof liquor would count as one drink. While alcohol consumption is a less widespread issue than sugar consumption, the effects of excessive intake are far more damaging. Considering that most restaurants, bars, and alcohol manufacturers profit by encouraging immoderate consumption, we have to take it upon ourselves to realize that many times what we casually consider a drink is in fact more. With an intake pattern above moderation, it's a short and slippery slope toward heavy drinking and possibly addiction. Our consumption patterns are dramatically influenced by marketing, but they're also molded by social norms. Most of us struggle when we act in a manner different than that of our peers, colleagues, friends, and family. If those in our social circles eat high sugar foods, it's hard to be the one to deviate from those choices. Alcohol works in the same way. Many social circles function on a steady influx of alcohol. Many working professionals, especially parents, have come to bond over or commiserate about the stresses of life with a bottle of wine. If we want to live healthier lives, if we want our children to develop good habits, sometimes we need to set the first and better example. Instead of saying everything in moderation and passively approving an excessive intake of unhealthy substances, we can take a critical look at what moderation actually is and adjust our habits accordingly. Setting a higher standard for ourselves helps others do the same. You just listened to the post titled Reconsidering Moderation by Becca Shearn of minimalwellness.com. A big thanks again to Becca for her permission to narrate from her site. Now, as you know, I'm one of the proponents of consuming things in moderation, but I agree with Becca in that we need to define what that is. And that's why on this show, I take so much time to give you actual numbers, actual servings, actual grams that you should be consuming each day. A few weeks back when I discussed alcohol in moderation, I actually quoted almost the exact same thing Becca mentioned in the post I read to you about what classifies as one drink because most people don't know what that means. To some folks, one drink is, oh, well, this one mixed drink I had at the bar, that should count as one drink, right? No, it's actually hard to say if that was just one drink. It depends on what went in it. And so I agree with Becca in that if you wanna consume things in moderation, Well, let's first define what moderation is for that particular food or that particular substance. Because the term moderation can mean different things for different substances. Now, before I go, now that we're halfway through the month already, just a quick reminder that we give away books to random people on our mailing list on the first of every month. So if you wanna be a part of that for free, plus get some spreadsheets to help you optimize your life, come by oldpodcast.com and join the weekly newsletter. Again, that's oldpodcast.com, and it's totally free to join. All right, tomorrow's Friday, which means it's time for our usual Friday Q&A episode, so I hope to see you there where your optimal life awaits. Hello, Life Optimizer. This is Justin Mollick, creator and producer of this show and Optimal Living Daily, the brother podcast of this one. Literally, I'm Dr. Neil's brother. If you like the format of this show, you'll love Optimal Living Daily too, where I also read to you from blogs, but cover other topics like personal development, finance, and minimalism from bloggers like Derek Sivers, The Minimalists, Zen Habits, and many more. So for more amazing content read to you for free, come subscribe to Optimal Living Daily too, and together we'll optimize your life. You've been listening to Optimal Health Daily. Be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on each new episode and head to oldpodcast.com. That's oldpodcast.com for a free gift as well as more actionable tips and resources to help you maximize your potential. Thanks for joining us and remember your optimal life awaits.